Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak in this debate. And I also pay tribute to my uh, colleague, the member for Plymouth South, uh, Sutton, sorry, in Devonport, uh, for his comprehensive contribution in outlining the key concerns about the national shipbuilding strategy. And also for the member for New Forest East for outlining his uh, longer term perspective over the, the nutrition of the capability of the Royal Navy's frigate and destroyer fleet, which is a key aspiration which the National Shipbuilding Strategy ought to be trying to address as an outcome. Um, I um, first encountered the man who wrote the report that spurned the, or spurned, spurred the creation of the National Shipbuilding Strategy, John Parker, uh, about three years ago um, when he attended Glasgow University to deliver a speech on his uh, his history working in the shipbuilding industry. He had a great reputation as a managing director at Harland & Wolf Shipbuilders in the 1980s. And grew the, up through the ranks there as an apprentice and finished as the managing director. Um, and it was a really interesting uh, discussion about a long-term decline of British capability as once a world leader globally uh, in the shipbuilding industry to what is now a very marginal player, even in Europe, never mind the rest of the world. <clears throat> and I asked him three years, three years ago when I was working at BE Systems and his view, what was his greatest regret uh, in his career? And he stood up and said, my greatest regret is that Europe is building 90% of the world's cruise ships today. And Britain, with such a great heritage of building world-beating ocean liners and passenger ships, is building none. Uh, these are high-wage, highly well-equipped shipyards in Europe building these, these vessels, and Britain isn't building one of them. But as managing director of Harland & Wolf, when it was under British shipbuilders' ownership as nation a nationalised industry up until the late 1980s, um, he recognised the emerging market for cruise ships. It was re-emerging as a popular recreational pursuit. Uh, and Harlan & Wolf had developed proposed designs for cutting edge new cruise ships, went to the government to propose funding to build an, a new design that would uh, be for Carnival, which became one of the biggest cruise ships, uh, is the biggest cruise ship company in the world. And the government said they were not interested in that design. They wanted to fire sell, get rid of the assets, uh, and remove shipbuilding from public ownership. They were not interested in any sort of further investment in what they saw as a dying, dead industry. And that very same year, 1987, the year before Harland Wolf was sold off and Govan Shipyard was sold off, Meyer Werft in Germany, a family-owned business, uh, got state funding from the German government, State Investment Bank, to build a completely new undercover shipyard and then built the world's first modern cruise ship and today, that shipyard dominates the global market for cruise ship building, complex shipbuilding in Europe, building around 200,000 tonne plus ships every year. And I think that contrast and approach is, is, is symptomatic of a broader malaise that we face when it comes to industrial policy and industrial planning in Britain. Uh, happy to give way. Honourable friend for giving way. Can I uh, outline just what the devastating economic consequences were of that decision on cities like ours in Glasgow, Belfast and elsewhere in the UK? Yes, it was absolutely devastating the impact it had and we saw the wider issue of it faced in Govan as well which was a commercial shipyard right up until 1999 when Caverna pulled out which was the Norwegian oil company which built the, uh, rebuilt the yard in the early 1990s for commercial oil tankers and gas carriers. Uh, the result of that collapse and approach was disastrous. So John Parker said, just as we got British shipbuilders match fit, ready to compete, the rug was pulled out from under it. Just as it was ready to actually re-enter that market and be a globally competitive player, it was wrecked. And that's the, le the sad legacy of the collapse of British merchant shipbuilding to the point where we are entirely reliant today upon the Ministry of Defence to sustain what is left of British shipbuilding capability. And that is partly why I'm concerned about the national shipbuilding strategy that's restricted in its entirety the question of naval shipbuilding and not a wider issue about how we re-establish a foothold, a market foothold in commercial shipbuilding because I believe the two are intrinsically linked. And if we are to achieve competitive advantage, we ought to broaden our horizons and re-establish how we deliver a resurgence in British commercial shipbuilding capability. That was Sir John Parker's biggest regret. That's what drove his frustration at that time. And I think a lot of that is what underpins his recommendations uh, in this report. He talks about a vicious cycle, which I think the Honourable Member for New Forest East mentioned a vicious cycle of changing requirements of a year zero approach every time we approach a new shipbuilding programme in the Ministry of Defence that duplicates effort, that introduces unnecessary costs, uh, is so um, uh, bespoke in its approach to designing ships 
that introduces unnecessary costs, which renders British shipyards uncompetitive, even in the naval sphere, never mind the commercial sphere. Happy to do so. I thank the Honourable Member for giving way and uh, the Member for uh, Plymouth, um, Sutton and Devonport for actually securing this debate. I think uh, my Honourable Friend has just hit the nail on the head. It's a, the lack of a steady drumbeat of orders to ensure our industrial base has caused this problem and the wonderful words in the shipbuilding strategy actually aren't being delivered in government. Would my absolutely. friend agree? I, I absolutely agree with that uh, position. It's a cognitive dissonance that we see actually between the vision outline, the outcome desired and the prescription to, to deliver that uh, vision and commitment aren't in alignment. They aren't going to deliver it. And that's the tragedy of it. We all want to see the national shipbuilding strategy succeed. We are trying to deliver our own collective understanding of what's best for the British industrial uh, capability into this document so that we can achieve the outcome that will be a globally competitive and effective shipbuilding industry in the UK again. Um, the Honourable Lady mentions a, a feast and famine approach to British shipbuilding, which has long been an issue, particularly as the commercial capability has fallen away. Um, I, I look at, in stark contrast, to say the American approach to shipbuilding, the Arleigh Burke destroyer program has built or plans to build 77 ships and that has been under they have been under construction consistently the same hull under construction since 1988 so that's been the, the year before i was born these ships were being built and they're still planning to build more of them that is a consistency of approach that we ought to be thinking about adopting in the uk so it'll be essentially a continuation of the type 23 frigate program but adapting its technology and its capability but essentially maintaining the learning curves achieved over a you know potentially 30 year build program I mean, that would be a huge opportunity for British shipping. Why do we insist on stopping every time we build six Type 45s, starting from scratch on a Type 26 hull, when essentially a Type 45 platform could have been adapted to deliver the same capability as a Type 26? You know, it's, it's, a, it's an approach which is wrong-headed. We have, on the Type 45 project, something like 13 different types of watertight doors. You know, why do we have this huge level of variance in the programmes? We have no standardisation. We have no grip over the design of it. We have no standard approaches to delivering design. We have no innovation and in adopting new products and defence standards. We have no resilience or innovation in defence when it comes to an entrepreneurial way of delivering ships. If we were to benchmark it against how, for example, Maya Verfa to build a complex cruise ship, the, del the delivery, the lead time between specification to delivery of the ship is, is minuscule compared to what we do with the equivalent ship of, say, our Type 26 platform, which is years. It's unacceptable, and uh, we need to seriously grip that if we want to really drive down cost and deliver value in the naval shipbuilding industry and actually achieve the outcomes in terms of numbers for the Royal Navy that we desire. Uh, and the prescription is chaotic. It talks about a vision for having a more certainty about the Royal Navy's procurement plans, yet wants to introduce a competitive programme for Type 31. That goes, exact, it goes right back to the early 1990s with the Type 23 programme where Swan Hunters was competing with Yarrow shipbuilders on the Clyde. And what happened? None of those shipyards could invest in modern facilities, modern practices that would deliver the benefits in terms of time scale and manner efficiencies that would allow the ships to be delivered for value for money. And it ended with the collapse of Swan Hunters and a drip feeding of orders where there was huge redundancies in the shipping industry and huge uncertainty. That's a recipe to return to that model that was deeply flawed in the 1990s and led to the, ultimately the loss of British shipbuilding capability. And that is why we are appealing today for a commitment to uphold what was originally planned in the Terms of Business Agreement, which was extinguished, as I received in the letter of the 19th of October from the Right Honourable Member's uh, colleague, the Right Honourable Member for Bournemouth East, saying the Terms of Business Agreement was extinguished, which committed to a single world-class site for, uh, for complex warship building on the Clyde and investing in that shipyard facility to make it world-class upper yeah. quartile. And that would deliver their benefits industrially to allow us to deliver our national shipbuilding programme for frigates and destroyers which would ensure they have a consistency of build that would be effective, would deliver the long-term benefits, learning curves, efficiencies, that would drive down the cost of these ships and allow them to be built at volume, as the uh, right honourable member mentioned, is necessary to sustain a larger Royal Navy fleet. That is the way we should be doing this. It's not about spreading it around. That will not work. And that is where the Royal Fleet Auxiliary Programme is, has better potential because it has a lower gross compensated tonnage. It's a less complex ship, but it's still a complex ship. And if that tonnage of 40,000 tonnes each was spread around the remaining UK shipyards, that would provide the bedrock of capacity to sustain all those shipyards around the UK, whilst having the, the designated uh, complex war shipyard in the Clyde. That is what happens with the Canadian shipyards, the Australian shipyards, it's what happens in the United States. That is the approach we ought to be having. Why has the National Shipbuilding Strategy not taken account of international benchmarks? Why has it not got a, com a commercial shipbuilding uh, focus as well 
to develop a longer term model based on European norms? And why are we not committed to building British ships, including the Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships in the UK? I hope that's a, I could go on for much longer because it's a, a topic that I'm very closely associated with. <laughs> but in summary, that is essentially what we want to see changed in order to make the national shipping strategy worth, worthy of the name that it deserves. And we need to have a world-class UK shipping industry back. And this is the way to do it if you adopt these suggested improvements. Thank you. Yeah.